God's Light in Days of Difficulty Part 1 God's Light in Days of Difficulty Part 1 John W. E. Bramhall Life for the path can only be given to us by God, 1 John 1 verse 5. In every age God has given light to His people, specific counsel suitable for each period. When they walked in His light they overcame their difficulties, but when they refused, failure resulted and they were in darkness. In the confusion today, rather than being indifferent, we should understand the light that God has given to preserve us. His method has been to give one leading truth for each period, sufficient light to guide and to preserve His people. Consider some examples from the Scriptures. Adam, Genesis 2 verses 15 to 17 The counsel given to Adam in the Garden of Eden was sufficient to guide and preserve him from the guile of the serpent. Failure and ruin followed when Eve listened and assented to the denial of God's words, In the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Obedience would have overcome the suggestions of Satan, this cannot be denied. Satan knew this so well that his scheme was to pervert God's word, deny its truthfulness and deprive his victim of all power to see or to preserve the right path. Adam and Eve refused God's counsel and were led into darkness. God's instructions would have effectually guided them safely through the testing for this was his special counsel at the time. Noah, Genesis 9 verses 1 to 17 In Noah's day God gave two special lines of counsel. A. He was to occupy a place of superiority over all the earth. Everything was placed under his dominion in order to govern the earth for God into your hand, are they delivered, verses 1 to 7. B. God also gave the sign of his covenant, verses 8 to 17. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Here we find two lines of instruction to guide and to preserve Noah and his sons in their day through all the difficulties. If they maintained it they would find light to escape from the perils, if not, they must be overcome and lose ground. Noah's failure, and his sons, was evidenced when Noah himself was overcome by wine and when his son showed in subjection and disrespect, Genesis 9 verses 20-27. The ultimate failure consummated at the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11 verses 1 to 9, in complete disregard to God's counsel. God gave unqualified supremacy and authority for men to govern the earth, and his link and covenant was the centralization of it. No other counsel could preserve them in the time they lived. The first indication of departure was Noah himself, then the failure which followed was climaxed by the organized rebellion at the Tower of Babel. The failure can only be attributed to the unfortunate neglect of the counsel of God. Abraham, Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3 The counsel that God gave Abraham was brief but definite. God called him to walk a separated path from the idolatrous world around. His obedience always secured blessing and deliverance, the neglect of it invariably involved him in sorrow and perplexity. He fulfilled God's counsel in Genesis 12 verse 5, then departed from it to go into Egypt, Genesis 12 verses 10 to 20. He was victorious in the case of Lot, ch. 13. He undoubtedly taught Isaac the counsel of God, but his descendants neglected it. Isaac was self-indulgent, Genesis 27 verses 1 to 4, Jacob was self-willed, Genesis ch. 29 through 31. The sons of Jacob were rebellious, Genesis ch. 34 and 37, and eventually the posterity of Jacob had so neglected God's counsel that they were obliged, because of grievous famine, to leave the land of Canaan and go down into Egypt. Moses and Joshua, Exodus 3 verses 8 to 10, Joshua 1 verses 1 to 10 God gave Moses a promise, I am come down etc. and a command, bring my people out of Egypt etc. This was God's call and his light for their path in that day, his mind and will for his people. When Moses walked according to it he was successful and above the difficulties of that time. When he swerved from it, for any cause, be it personal incompetence, the unbelief of the people, the power of Egypt, etc., in proportion as he swerved from it, or hesitated, he failed. Eventually, the people murmured and were even destroyed. Refusing the counsel of God they were condemned to wander in the wilderness forty years until all the men had died, Numbers 14 22-38. God's counsel was committed to Joshua, Joshua 1 verses 1 to 10, and was virtually the same as given to Moses. He was called to be strong and very courageous in completing what Moses had not finished, Joshua 1 verse 9. In Joshua chapter 23, before his death, Joshua repeated the counsel of God to the judges and officers of Israel. 
Only by observing the complete counsel of God that had been given to Moses could the possession of Canaan be enjoyed, Joshua 23 verse 6. Alas! How incomplete this was can be learned from the record in the book of Judges, Judges 2 verses 1 to 4 etc. As Israel's history continued through the days of the judges, through the history of their kings, and later through the days of their prophets, what was the outcome? In spite of occasional blessings through David, Hezekiah, Josiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Daniel, etc., they greatly neglected the counsel of God for their day. Though the prophets endeavored to lead God's people back into line with God's counsel time and time again, yet the Old Testament closes with the sad evidence of moral insensibility existing and prevailing in Israel. The failure of the nation is graphically portrayed in the closing book of the Old Testament by the prophet Malachi. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, What have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, It is vain to serve God, and what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy, yeah, they that work wickedness are set up, yeah, they that tempt God are even delivered. Malachi 3 verses 13 to 15. Let us summarize at this point some lessons from the history of God's people in the past periods. We can recognize an obvious principle for our present day. It is this we are warned and assured that there must be for us in our day some simple but definite counsel from God, which, if we will observe, would guide and help us through all our difficulties. On the contrary, if his counsel is neglected and refused, we can but be exposed to the confusion and defeat that prevails around. If we will learn that God has certain fixed principles in his ways in government, and that he will not deviate from his divine instructions to his people, nor can he, for it would be contrary to his moral character, if we will learn this truth in our hearts, it will prove great gain. These examples from the Old Testament should conclusively prove to us that God always gives a counsel suitable for the times his people live in. When we face confusion and the powerlessness to escape from our difficulties in the testimony of the church, the fact can be traced to our neglect of his counsel. A very simple question would be proper to raise and ask ourselves, which is, what is the leading counsel of God given for us in this age, and what is his light for those who would walk according to it? There is no question of God's insufficiency, that he would fail to give the light upon the path which we need in these dark, apostate days of our history. For God is light, and in him is no darkness at all, 1 John 1 verse 5. Our God is light, and though we go across a trackless wild, our Savior's footsteps ever shew the path for every child. God, God's Light in Days of Difficulty Part 2 God's Light in Days of Difficulty Part 2 John W. E. Bramhall we now consider the New Testament teaching of God's counsel to his people. First in order is John the Baptist, Matthew 3 verses 1 to 12 As the forerunner of the Messiah, his ministry to Israel was different from preceding times. The heart of his message was condensed by his command, Repent why ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3 verse 12. His work was to prepare the way for the king and his kingdom, Matthew 3 verse 3, by baptism unto repentance, so that the nation would be morally ready for his appearing. Those who accepted his message were blessed, but the rejectors were condemned. And all the people that heard him, and the publicans, justified God, being baptized with the baptism of John, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him, Luke 7 verses 29 and 30. It was God's leading counsel for his people at that period. The Lord Jesus Christ, John 1 verses 1 to 13 When Christ came from heaven to earth, then the fullness of divine light appeared to man. He was the true light that shone in the darkness, and yet the darkness comprehended it not, John 1 verse 5. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, John 8 verse 12. With such a light what other counsel could be the guide for God's people in that day? The past counsels of God would be unsuitable when the Son of God Himself was on earth in person. The Father's voice from heaven declared, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye Him, Matthew 17 verse 5. Those who heard and received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, etc., John 1 verses 12 and 13. Each one who followed Him and acknowledged Him, the Simeons, the Annas, the disciples, the faithful women, etc., did not walk in darkness but had the light of life. 
They knew his doctrine that it was of God, John 7 verse 17. Everyone who rejected him, he could but declare words of judgment upon them, saying, If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins, John 8 verse 24. What was the ultimate result? It became the darkest night in Israel's history when the nation cried, Away with him! Crucify him! John 19 verse 15. The crucifixion of their Messiah was the greatest tragedy in all the history of Israel. The rejection of the greatest light produced the beginning of the greatest night for his earthly people. What a long night it has been! It is all summarized by the sad words of John 1 verse 11, He came unto his own and his own received him not. Yet there is one great outstanding truth that continues to remain, in spite of the rejection of the Messiah by Israel. God has no other channel of divine counsel but his beloved Son to this world, for God hath in these last days spoken unto us in the person of his Son, Hebrews 1 verse 2. The risen, glorified Lord in heaven, remains the channel of God's communication to his people on the earth, he still is God's voice to all. God's counsel must now come from the glory and it is different to what it was when Christ lived on the earth. Christ's relationship to the earth has been changed and therefore his counsel to his people must change accordingly, also, the relationship of his people is now to one who is in heaven above, the man in the glory. The change of his people's relationship toward him now is readily perceived, between the risen Lord and devoted Mary Magdalene as recorded in John 20 verses 11 to 18. Because of this we are compelled to acknowledge that our risen Lord in heaven above, he alone, must be the guide and the counsel of God to his people on the earth. This will be seen as we follow through the New Testament. God's counsel from the risen Christ, Acts 1 verse 1 through 7 hours 60 minutes from the time of his ascension to the death of Stephen, God's leading counsel to Israel was determined by the position of Christ in glory. From heaven above Christ offered himself to Israel, for the apostles testified that the times of refreshing were to come from the presence of the Lord and that God would send Jesus Christ, which was preached unto you. Read Acts 3 verses 19 to 26 and note verses 19 to 20. The apostles preached this according to God's mind at the time. God had raised Jesus from the dead and made him both Lord and Christ, Acts 2 verse 36. He was the one who could bring in the sure mercies of David and until the Lord was rejected in his resurrection, God offered the kingdom to Israel. Though the church was already formed, yet the apostles were in harmony with God's will and counsel for that day, for until Christ was rejected by Israel in his resurrection God was offering to them the kingdom. The readiness of Christ to come is indicated by his position in heaven above, as Stephen, being filled with the Holy Ghost, looked steadfastly up into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, Acts 7 verses 55 and 56. The defense of Stephen before the rulers of Israel in Acts chapter 7 was virtually a recital of Israel's history of rejection to God's counsel through the ages past, being culminated by the fearless words of God's faithful servant in verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did so do ye. So once again Stephen, under God, accused the leaders of the nation of rejecting the counsel of God but this time from Christ in glory. Their rejection became conclusive by their violent and deliberate stoning of God's faithful servant as they, when they heard these things, were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth, Acts 7 verse 54. How tragic and significant is the divine record of this culminating event as recorded in Acts 7 verses 57 and 58. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. So Stephen, while looking for Christ to come from the glory, when being stoned to death, learns by the Spirit that there was a place for him now. With Christ in glory. This concludes the testimony of that day, that Christ ascended on high was offering to return to the earth, and according to this counsel for that day, the saints were looking to him, the ascended one and expecting him to come and reign. Hence, Christ is no longer offering himself to them as he was then when standing at the right hand of God. From henceforth we find that he is sitting down, but though the counsel of God subsequently is a different one, nevertheless it is connected with our Lord Jesus Christ in the glory as we shall see. God has no other channel of communication to his people but the one who is now seated on his right hand above. It is significant that as Stephen was stoned the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. 
the next counsel of God to his people for our present age, was communicated to this young man when the Christ of glory revealed himself to him at his conversion on the Damascus road. Saul is called by the Lord Jesus from the glory to be a minister and a witness of those things which he had seen and of those things in the which the Lord would appear to him. Acts 26 verse 16 The leading counsel and truth for us today we shall take up in our next paper, our relationship to the man in the glory. Why? I was journeying in the noontide, when his light shone o'er my road, and I saw him in that glory, saw him, Jesus, Son of God. All around in noonday splendor, earthly scenes lay fair and bright, but my eyes no more behold them for the glory of that light. Marvel not that Christ in glory all my inmost heart hath won, not a star to cheer my darkness, but a light beyond the sun. All below lies dark and shadowed, nothing there to claim my heart, save the lonely track of sorrow where of old he walked apart. All the wonders of his glory, deeper wonders of his love, how for me he won, he keepeth that high place in heaven above, not a glimpse, the veil uplifted, but within the veil to dwell, gazing on his face forever, hearing words unspeakable. I have seen the face of Jesus, tell me not of aught beside, I have heard the voice of Jesus, all my soul is satisfied. In the radiance of the glory first I saw his blessed face, and forever shall that glory be my home, my dwelling place. God's Light in Days of Difficulty Part 3 God's Light in Days of Difficulty Part 3 John W. E. Bramhall We now consider the leading counsel of God for the present day. When Christ was glorified as man in heaven, his relationship to earth was changed. Of necessity the counsel of God for his people likewise changed. In their relationship, God's people are now united to the man in the glory. For God does not speak to us through any other person but the person of his beloved Son, Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 3. For this reason, Saul of Tarsus, later called Paul, was apprehended by the Lord of glory himself on the Damascus road to be his chosen vessel of divine communication to the church today. His unique conversion, different in circumstances to others, was for a specific purpose which the Apostle later declared in Acts 26 verse 16 as a twofold objective. 1. To be a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen. 2. And of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. The appearance of the glorified Lord to Paul emphasizes an essential truth we have lost sight of today, that Christ in glory is the source and spring of all blessing to his people. He is head over all things to the church which is his body, Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23, Colossians 1 verse 18. Though we have other important doctrines in the New Testament, this one is the leading truth of God's counsel for us today, the headship of Christ. His preeminence in this relationship to his people is of paramount importance. Its truth directs us into two lines of responsibility. 1. Our personal responsibility toward the headship of Christ. This has been exemplified in the Apostle Paul's experience. Upon his conversion, the Christ of glory was not only revealed to him as Savior, but also as Lord. At once Paul grasped the truth that Christ was the head of his body of people on earth. This he demonstrated as he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Acts 9 verse 6. The realization of it brought full submission to the one who has supreme authority over his people. It enabled him from that moment to faithfully press toward the ultimate goal during his whole Christian testimony on earth, see Philippians 3 verse 14. Is not this the leading truth for each believer to obey today? Our obedience to the Lordship of Christ will enable us to walk through this scene of difficulty in His strength, in His power and in blessed harmony with the Spirit of God and the Word God. It is most unfortunate today that God's leading counsel, for the greater part, is conspicuously absent amongst us. Would present-day confusion and divided opinions prevail if each believer was wholly submissive to the headship of Christ? The clear responsibility for each of us is to walk by the same rule and mind the same thing, Philippians 3 verse 15. Outward evidence today would indicate that as it was in the closing days of the judges, so it is today, every man did that which was right in his own eyes, Judges 21 verse 25, rather than in the eyes of the Lord. The leading counsel of God for this age has not changed, nor will it, until the Lord comes for his own. Regardless of what other believers may do, each believer is still responsible to the Lord above as an individual. With yielded hearts and wills we should say, Lord, what wilt? 
THOU have me to do? 2. Our corporate responsibility toward the headship of Christ. The complete New Testament revelation of the headship of Christ was communicated to Paul in accordance with the Lord's promise that he would minister those things in which I will appear unto thee, Acts 26 verse 16. None can question the fact that all corporate truth regarding the church has been given to us through the writings of Paul. It clearly places each assembly in direct responsibility to the head in heaven above, to administrate and carry out the complete teaching of God's word in respect to the functions of Christ's assembly on the earth. Nothing must be added, nor anything deleted from what the Word reveals our responsibility to be to the head in heaven above. For the revelation of church truth is complete, Paul has declared all the counsel of God to the Ephesian elders Paul said, I have not shrunk from announcing to you all the counsel of God, Acts 20 verse 27. J and D, to the Colossians he wrote, Now, I rejoice in sufferings for you, and I fill up that which is behind of the tribulations of Christ in my flesh, for his body, which is the assembly, of which I became a minister, according to the dispensation of God which is given me towards you. T.O. Complete the Word of God, Colossians 1 verses 24 and 25, J and D. The last revealed truth to mankind in the Word of God is his truth concerning the church, and which was entrusted to the Apostle Paul to reveal to us. It is that great mystery which has not been made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed, read Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 10. The observation of corporate conditions today indicates that the headship of Christ over his people is not a living reality. The doctrine is often mentioned by some, yet not practiced. It is unimportant to others and totally disregarded by many. If this leading truth were realized in proper measure, we would find that God's counsel for us today would effectively help solve difficulties and enable us to be superior over the hindrances we face. We confess that the increasing confusion and chaos in the corporate character of the divine testimony on earth gives unmistakable evidence that for the larger part, the headship of Christ is not honored. The drifting of the Colossian believers into Judaism and human philosophy was by Paul attributed to their failure in not holding fast the head, from whom all the body, ministered to and united together by the joints and bands, increases with the increase of God, Colossians 2 verse 19, J and D. See also Ephesians 4 verses 15 and 16. The carnality of the Corinthian believers can also be attributed to their disobedience to this same leading truth, the Lordship of Christ. Paul, prior to his departure, wrote, All they which are in Asia be turned away from me, 2 Timothy 1 verse 15. Today, what would he say but his words recorded in Acts 27 verse 21, Ye should have hearkened unto me. The churches of Asia, in Revelation 2 and 3, in some particular way lost sight of Christ, and drifted away from his headship and authority, then failed. If Christ is our head in heaven, then each assembly should seek to faithfully maintain this relationship in practical obedience. Our ministry for him on the earth should begin in the glory where he now is. Our service, in its planning and directing, seems to originate from ourselves rather than from him above. We may be devoted and true heart in our efforts, but either through ignorance or neglect toward our head in heaven, we go about our service in our way and not in his way. All the assembly activity of worship and service should be wholly under the control of our living head in heaven above. Our responsibility toward God's leading counsel still remains the same until our Lord comes again. Let us realize this. If we will devotedly adhere to this paramount fact of his headship over us, we shall be sustained by him, through his spirit and his word and we shall keep in fellowship with our head in heaven above. Through this we shall have the strength, the grace and the wisdom of our Lord that will enable us to prove and experience that we seek to follow God's light in days of difficulty. Would it not be a blessed delight to hear him say to us when he comes, Thou hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name? Revelation 3 verse 8? God grant that this will be our desire and the determination of our whole beings.